Joining me now is Indigenous activist and prominent No campaigner, Warren Mundine, and he's going to help me unpack some of the complexities of what's been going on this week. Warren, thank you so much for joining me for the show. It's Glad really to good here. to have you. My first question... Ah, oh, good on you. The word treaty gets thrown around a lot in the context of the Uluru Statement, but it seems to me that it means really different things to different people. When Thomas Mayo and his fellow travellers talk about the need for big national and state-level agreements about things like reparations and compensation from colonialism, well, they make their meaning pretty clear. But when you talk about it, you point out that there's hundreds of small tribes that must speak for themselves and who should have the right to have input into future local land uses that are relevant for their local tribe. So... When you say treaty, are you on the same page as people like Mr Mayo and Senator Thorpe? <laughs> no. <laughs> they're, they're out to destroy Australia. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, let's cut to the chase. This whole thing about the referendum, the voice, is built on a lie uh, that, that, that Aboriginal people do not have voices. Well, that's just crap. You know, they're, they're, every corporate in Australia, every corporation in Australia, I should say, just about, every sporting body, every church, every uh, religious group, they all have Indigenous advisory committees or advisory or advisors. Uh, every government, local government, federal government, state government, territory government, all have advisors and people there. So this whole thing is just a fraud which has been pushed by these people. Uh, and, and, and look, and when they, when they talk about treaty, what they're talking about is actually overriding the traditional owners of this country. The traditional owners, as you said, Amanda, at, at this, for the last, you know, since 1993, when the, when the Native Title Act come in, plus going back to the 1976, when the Land Rights Act come in, have had the power to negotiate, consult and come to agreements on what happens on their land. And that, to me, is what it's all about. It's about ha having Indigenous Australians who are able to protect their cultural heritage, who are able to protect their country and able to get economic development and, 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 and jobs and kids to school through that process. And that's, and, and look, and that's where I'm coming from. My thing is not about, the, you know, talking about Australia's sovereignty. I recognise Australian sovereignty. It is about that we have a say and we do have that say and we have that very powerful say through those for, for that for the traditional owners yeah that's really helpful um in light of senator price's speech to the press club this week there's been some people who are it seems very eager to try and make the topic of colonialism the kind of yes no or good bad question now, no doubt there are some things that were bad and there were some things that were good about the colonial experience, but isn't the way forward here to stop looking at it in this, for want of a better term, black and white way, and instead say, what do we do now to make life better for all Australians? Well, you hit the nail on the head. If, if you're going to sit there and worry about what happened 200 years ago uh, and worry about that colonial experience over that, you know, that 1788 right up until the early 20th century, then uh, then you're never going to move forward. You, you, what you've got to do is recognise, everyone recognise, everyone knows the history, no one knows the facts. But since the 1967 uh, referendum post, you know, Second World War, for the last 56 years, we've got rid of all the race laws in this country. Uh, we've, we've, we're spending billions of dollars to help and work with Aboriginal people. And now it's about, you know, we've got to start making these people accountable for the money that's been spent because they were given money to lift their communities and lift their people out of, of poverty and get things happening. But if you're going to be trapped in this victimhood grievance uh, mentality, then you're not going to move forward. It's, it's a fact of life. You know, it, just about every race, every country in the world had been either colonised, invaded, uh, had civil wars and had horrible things that happened to them. And, but they've had to accept that history 
uh, and then move forward about, OK, how, how do we go forward from here? How do we make Australia a, a better place? How do we, how do we, how do we make Australia, uh, you know, what, which is one of the, the greatest liberal democracies in, in the world, as well as it has been one of the greatest uh, multicultural, multiracial, uh, multi-faith country in the world about how we handle it. In fact, we're one of the most less racist countries in the, in, in the history of humanity. You're on the record, Warren, as saying something that's pretty courageous in the context of a debate that seems oriented towards entrenching grievance culture and group blame and victimhood. The, the courageous thing you said was, quote, the only person who can change your life is you. It's a fundamental statement of common sense, but why is this so rare in the context of the voice debate? Oh, because people are living off the misery of Aboriginal people. You only have to look at it. Uh, you, know, you know, as long if if all Aboriginal ki uh, kids got to school and got education, if if the adults, their parents, and that got jobs, you know, we wouldn't need these government departments. We wouldn't need all these all these so-called organisations out there to help us. You know, we'd be, we'd be driving ahead, we'd be running a massive economy. We own 55% of the Australian land mass. We've got some of the biggest uh, mining and energy and agricultural lands in the country. And, and that would make us very self-determined. And people got to remember that when you got talk about self-determination, it starts with self. You can spend as much money, you can have as many psychologists, you can have as many people as you want, but unless you want to move forward, it means nothing. I reckon that speaks to a lot of people. Finally, James Morrow revealed this week that Thomas Mayo, the, one of the lead designers of The Voice, was encouraging his union colleagues to exercise the special rights they have under the Fair Work Act to enter work sites for the purposes of pushing the yes case. Now, Warren, these are special powers gifted to unions for the narrow purpose of representing employees or investigating breaches of legislation. Is it an abuse of those special powers to use it to campaign for the yes side of the referendum? Oh, look, there's no doubt about that. That's that's exactly what it is. That they're abusing their their, their the workers' rights in there. But why should we be surprised? You know, Thomas Mayer is is a well-known uh, uh, socialist. He's a well-known uh, you know supporter of the communists. He's he's he's, he's uh, you know, if you ever seen anything that is not. Uh, Aboriginal culture, then you only have to look at the communists because we are very spirit, spiritual, we are very religious people and, and, and we are a group of people who, who, who are trying to drive forward and, and, and make our country better and we're very happy to be uh, a part of, the Austra of Australia and be Australian citizens and, and also to play our role in helping to build this country as a better country. Warren Mundine, thank you very much for your time tonight.